Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome to the final keynote uh, for today uh, from Zurich. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to uh, introduce Alex McSleen, who is a research fellow at Then Try This, and most famously known as one of the pioneers and uh, yeah, really started the Algo Rave and Top Lab movement. Um, he's the co-author of Tidal Cycles, um, and I think he succeeded at uh, something where many of us failed. He actually manages to, peop to get people who really don't care about coding at all very excited about writing Haskell. So please tell us how to do this. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation. It's really great to connect with the Haskell community. <clears throat> um, so really great to meet people, make contacts, and exchange ideas. Um, yeah, as Jasper said, I made this Tidal Cycles thing. How many people have heard of Tidal Cycles? OK, how many people have managed to get it installed? Ah, not so many. <laughs> how many people have been to an Algo Rave? Ah, quite a few. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll explain what these things are. Um, but yeah, I'm from Then Try This, so I'm not an academic, but uh, I am a research fellow um, funded by UK Research and Innovation um, for a seven year project about algorithmic patterns, including working on tidal cycles and friends. Um, but yeah, so live coding, what is it? That's me doing some live coding. Um, so, I guess the word live. Um, could mean live audience, um, or it could mean live interaction. Um, live coding is often used just in presentations where people do some programming in front of an audience. But this is a bit different, I think. This uh, is about making music during a performance by writing code live. So the code is like an instrument or an environment for making music. Um, so at the start of a performance, I start with an empty screen and then sort of explore ideas, listen to what the code's doing, and then modify it in response um, in order to try and get people dancing, which are not doing it in that photograph, never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so live coding is kind of a live algorithmic music practice. Um, the word algorithm is quite broad, I suppose, in terms of some kind of procedure or um, something involving, uh, I guess, the lambda calculus is made to sort of formalize what an algorithm is. Uh, but with algorithmic music, I think it means something in particular. Um, and I think uh, it's about pattern making, basically. Um, so I see algorithm and pattern as being synonymous. Um, it'd be interesting to see what math math mathematicians think about this. Uh, but I, I, I kind of see patterns as being something which we're used to thinking about, being really kind of culturally grounded, like patterns in textiles. Um, whereas algorithm these days, it's often used to describe something that controls us, sort of abstract and grounded. So kind of thinking about these two words together, I think helps shine light on both. Um, but sometimes it's nice to think about the most extreme form of something in order to make a point. So try and imagine what the most extreme form of algorithmic music is, sort of noisy, weird, obsessed, um, and, yeah, method ringing. So this is uh, English tradition where you get people often retired in church, churches, ringing bells, these great big things, very different, difficult to control. Um, so all you can do when you're ringing them is slightly speed them up or slightly speed them down, slow them down. Um, so if you start off playing a sequence one, two, three, four, five, six, um, all you can do is swap adjacent pairs. Um, and somehow, since, uh, I don't know, 17th century or something, whole practice has emerged of people doing this, to sometimes do full permutations, which is possible with six bells, less with 12. Um, uh, to, yeah, and, and they never repeat the same sequence, um, and they can go for hours. Like, that's a plaque commemorating um, doing 9,020 changes in six hours and 17 minutes, a change being one sequence. 
Um, and I find it fascinating that people are fundamentally fascinated by patterns uh, to the point of very strange obsession um, and always have been. Uh, so I think algor this is clearly algorithmic music um, and it's been happening for a very long time. There's another couple of examples. This a, on the left is a uh, composition by a minimalist composer, Steve Reich, which is just uh, clapping. Um, but there's two people do it, and the second person occasionally skips one of the beats so that they go out of phase. Um, 12 repetitions of each phase until they come back in again. Um, and this on the right is something much older, thousands of years old, um, a corvai from South India. Um, this is part of the conical tradition where they repeat these phrases which are kind of onomatopoeic, representing um, sounds on the Mridangam drum. And the corvai has this kind of geometric structure where, again, you're kind of removing um, uh, steps from a sequence um, in order to, uh, yeah, create kind of phasing patterns, strange syncopations. Um, and with this uh, South Indian music, you always have an underlying tala. In this case, it's the Adi tala, which you count in eight. Uh, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, so if I try and do number seven, for example, by going around repeating each of these phrases once, according to this um, kind of map, it would be something like, I usually get this wrong, so let's see. <laughs> Tadagina tondim, takadina. Oh, hang on, that's wrong. Yeah. Tadagina tondim, dim. Tadagina tondim, takadina dim. Tadim, takadina dim. Takita dim, takadim. Takita dim, takadim. Takita dim, takadim. Tak. Yeah, I forgot. But you get the idea. So there's this kind of. There's this pattern going on, and then there's this ground, which is the tala, and you feel that the rhythm's moving around and syncopating with that tala. Um, I can normally do it, honest. <laughs> um, I just want to make this uh, really important point. Um, these are all algorithmic music practices, but there's no automation involved, but they are computational. Um, I think this is a real confusion in digital arts in, in particular, confusing computation with automation. Um, uh, often people cite the, um, the Jacquard device, which was stuck on top of a loom in order to automate it with punch cards. Um, but actually, the Jacquard device is just about automation. It's not about computation at all. And what's computational is the weaving, um, the actual uh, weaving on the loom. Um, and this is one example. So this is a loom controlled by um, a human using their feet to select um, frames. There's no, th it's not threaded, there's no, it's not warped, so you can't actually see it in action. But this is uh, the traditional notation for um, describing a weave. Um, along the top, you see how to thread the shafts. On the top right, you see how to connect the shafts to the Treadles, with the, and then on the right hand side, that's the pattern which you use when actually weaving to move your feet on those treadles. So, this is actually a form of binary matrix multiplication. Um, so, there's no automation here, but it's very computational. And you can see the kind of in the, in the middle is, is the sort of effect that appears. I think it's called an echo weave or something. Um, and you can find more examples of these kind of heritage algorithms on this forum I've set up, forum.algorithmicpattern.org, um, if you're interested or know some more heritage algorithms to share. Um, so another point is that determinism is not the same as predictability. So title cycles is entirely deterministic, but it's very difficult to predict what it's going to do. Um, a simple example, this isn't tidal, this is just a very simple bit field um, algorithm. So x, um, bitwise and y, which is the x and y position. If you 
um, do a bitwise and of the x and y, and then take the module over nine, and then color that pixel white if the result is zero, then you'll get an image. And it's quite hard to imagine what kind of image that will be without running it, but each time you run it, it produces the same thing. It's kind of a beautiful um, alien landscape. Um, and so the actual meaning of this result is really all about human perception. Um, so these two things, even though one creates the other, are in completely different domains, really. Um, and that's really the, what's interesting about patterns, is you have these very simple ingredients that you can really play with in order to just experiment and see what comes out. And that's sort of what I'm doing when I'm live coding. Um, so yeah, uh, so Algorave is all about algorithmic dance culture. Um, and again, looking back at history, one example of this would be the Maypole dance people following a procedure, dancing in, in, in and out of each other in order to create a braid on the um, maypole. Um, I think this idea was probably taken from uh, Tamil Nadu. This is an example of a uh, dance that creates a braid, uh, much more complex than the average uh, maypole dance. but. Um, uh, yeah, uh, of course, when, once you've made a complex braid, you then have to undo it by reversing your steps, which is quite nice. Um, so, yeah, I guess... Um, oh, and one more example. Um, Al Jazari um, in Upper Mesopotamia in the 12th century uh, made robots which not only um, danced and played music, but also poured drinks for royal dance parties. Um, and yeah, in his book he writes, when an hour has passed, the musicians perform with a clamorous sound which is heard from afar. So basically this was an hour grave, I think, uh, but quite some time ago. Um, so I guess in all this I'm trying to get across the idea that this kind of thing is nothing new, it's fundamentally human, um, it's not really futuristic. Um, it's, it's ways of connecting um, something like programming with something that's very human, so that we're really compelled to do, explore patterns together. Um, unfortunately, journalists don't necessarily see that, it that way, so every kind of six years, um, I get interviewed by Wired magazine, and they, uh, yeah, say that this is uh, of the future, it's going to, it's uh, the future of electronic music, it's going to replace DJs, that's not the idea. DJs are great. Um, uh, yeah, I, th I just find it a bit annoying, really, that um, something which I've been doing for about 20 years now um, is always talked about, bit, about being in the future. Um, so, yeah, so this is what an grave looks like. Um, so that's my friend Shelley and Joanne, uh, Alga Babes, performing at an Alga Rave in Manchester at um, Blue Dot Festival. Um, it's a really wonderful feeling, actually, um, sort of being lost in this world of abstract symbols, while at the same time having a very physical response by the people in front of you, and, of course, by the speakers, uh, sub-bass. Um, it's kind of a strange feeling, kind of being really in time with the people around you, really connected. It's a sort of full body experience. Um, I really recommend trying it out. Um, so, yeah, and as Jasper said, um, building title cycles has, has been much about building or making space for a community around it, as it is actually being a technological development. Um, I see them as in a sort of really part of the same thing, really. Um, making some technology, um, sharing it with people, uh, and seeing what it means to them, uh, seeing what they do with it, um, while also organizing events, festivals around it. Um, so I guess events like this is as important for Haskell as it is. Uh, and our grave is as important for tidal cycles. Um, okay, so this is what a our grave sounds like. 
You see Haskell there on the screen. Yeah, <laughs> just a little clip. Um, that's all you get on Instagram these days. Um, so, yeah, but you can see it's a particular context for Haskell. So all the people who have contributed to Haskell, um, I don't know if you have this in mind, but uh, it's happening. Um, so, yeah, uh, but yeah, let's move on to actually look at Tidal Cycles itself. So I've been working on it um, for uh, quite some time. I started off in the early 2000s using a language called Perl, which was quite popular at the time, um, and started live coding in that, but it was really um, difficult, uh, slow, using a general purpose language to try and make music with. I was collaborating with percussionists, and it would take me a minute or two to actually even start making music. Um, so that was the real design, design pressure that made me start to think about making my own environment, um, my own language. Heard about Haskell via Pugs, so that was an implementation of Perl 6. Um, very, someone very quickly um, developed uh, an interpreter for this uh, very tricky project, Perl 6, uh, in Haskell. Uh, and that, yeah, at the time I was a research student, so I had some time to really explore it, and that started me on my embedded domain specific journey. And I stuck with it because something really beautiful about describing musical composition with functions, um, it just works really well in a very declarative way. Um, it just makes sense. Um, and of course, Haskell has really nice. Syntax, things like partial application are great, um, and the ability to just define operators and things like that um, just means that it's much quicker to type in code, which is super important when you're trying to make music for people in front of you. Um, but more than anything, oh, and also no runtime errors in theory, which is good if you're making music. Um, but it's also great for uh, thinking deeply about the representation of music. Um, and that's really what has made me stick with it. Um, so really staring at these types, actually for over periods of years, to try and get to what I really think musical rhythm is about for me. Um, having these types grow and then shrink as I kind of really hone in what it means. Um, but a big inspiration has been functional reactive programming. Um, so, to d introduce titles, types, I'll just start with the types from Fran by Colonel Elliot, um, where time is floating point, although he kind of conceptualized it as being real. Um, and this idea of behavior being um, a function from time to values active at that time, as we've seen in other workshops and things. Um, so this is great, but um, the problem is that music can have very short events, things like a balloon pop only happens in an instance, but, instant, but can have huge musical consequences. Um, so if you uh, have continuous time in this way, then you can miss an event. Um, but I didn't want to have discrete time. Uh, Oh, the first thing I did was rename behavior to pattern and make time rational uh, because um, music's all about ratios and floating point errors are really annoying. <laughs> um, but yeah, so instead of having a function from time to events, I moved to this idea of having patterns as a function from time spans to events active within that time span. So you're kind of querying a window of time, seeing which events are active in that time. Then the event itself has its own time span to say when it's active. So you can ask for a query, and you might get several events back active within that time. And a time span is just 
has a beginning and an end. Um, and that's worked really well. It's like, uh, um, yeah, nice representation of uh, infinite time. I use the integer sequence as marking metrical um, cycles. Um, uh, and so things happen within those cycles, as uh, so they may repeat or not, but the cycle is the reference point. Um, but there's one problem, which is that if you, what happens if you ask for a slot of time and you get an event which starts on that time but doesn't end within that time? Um, and so I just added an extra field which is describing what the whole time would be. So that allows you to have event fragments, um, either because the event is continuing outside or starts before your time window, or because you've done some pattern transformation which has ended up fragmenting the events. Um, that's ended up being super important. Um, but you'll notice also that the, may, the whole is optional. Um, that is because some events don't have holes, and they are continuous events. So this means that you can represent continuous patterns in the same representation as discrete patterns. Um, so if you have a sine wave, um, there, and you query it with a time window, you'll get back an event, a single event, uh, without a hole, because continuous events are not fragments of anything, they just are. <laughs> um, and it will sample at the center of the time span of the query. Um, so that's really nice that you can represent both discrete and continuous patterns in the same representation, means you can add them together. Um, you can add together sine waves or square waves or noise or whatever, as well as um, uh, to discrete uh, patterns, as I'll show you in a bit. Um, and that's it, so I don't need anything else because uh, i just got this completely pure representation of music, and if I want to develop music, interact with it, all I do is change the code. Um, because I'm a live coder, so I don't need any representation of interaction at all. All the interaction is in GHCI. Um, so, that's it. Are there any questions at this point before I do some demos? Um, sorry to bring that on you sound people. <laughs> is there a microphone handy? Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just a little bit cu curious about your definition of behaviors and patterns in this case. Why is it a list of events, or why was behavior, why was the range of a behavior a list of A's and not just a single A? Um, because you can query a time span and there might be more than one thing happening in that time span. Okay. All right, good. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so you've got a list of events. Yeah. <laughs> so it's mon uh, polyphonic, in other words. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, what should we imagine for the, the type A? Is it like a tone or a frequency or just to kind of conceptualize um, it? It can be bit? anything. So uh, it could be musical notes or it could be a hash representing uh, parameters of a synthesizer. Um, I've also used it for weaving and robots and things like that. So any kind of pattern, really. Um, yeah, most often it would be a hash, in, in the context of music, be a hash for representing a synthesizer message. Um, I think there was one more question, and then I'll carry on with the demo. Thanks. Um, so if you're reloading this in GHCI, does that not cause a tiny little break whilst it recompiles? Uh, no, so it's just um, replacing the pure, one pure function with another, then there's something else which is actually doing the scheduling. Um, and yeah, there's no, there's no break. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> As I'll demonstrate. Okay, one more and then. <laughs> is there any way to have multiple people playing music at the same time and kind of jamming together? And if so, how would you synchronize the machines? 
Um, yes, there is. So, um, uh, so if two people are on the same network, it will automatically synchronize um, using a protocol called Link. And there's also web-based environments you can use to collaborate with people in other parts of the world. And then that's nice because there's no latency involved because you're just sharing bits of code. Um, so yeah, I can share some links for that. Um, but yeah, let's get on with actually showing the thing <laughs> instead of talking about the thing. Um, so what does it look like? So the first thing we do is make one of these strings I'm going to have to put on my glasses, aren't I? That's a good idea. So this just is just like a bass drum, then a snare drum, which will then play forever. This. Sorry, that's out of sync. I'm just going to have to restart that. Uh, uh, seems to be. Yeah, it's uh, a brand new editor that's all made, uh, and it seems to go out of synchronization after a little while. Um, not sure why. Um, okay, let's try again. That's better. Okay. Um, so the first thing you see is that there's strings involved, um, which uh, I can sense some people kind of recoiling against, the idea of having strings <laughs> um, and say, oh, it's stringly typed. Ah. Um, and fair enough, but it's not, it is passed into a function straight away. So it's an overloaded string that's passed using parsec. Um, so the stuff in the double quotes is just a really fast way of making sequences. Um, so for example, this is such a sequence, uh, quite a complicated one. Uh, to do that in just Haskell, would, this is the equivalent thing, um, but it would be a lot more to type in, which is obviously super important when um, live coding. Uh, so it's like a little um, domain-specific language embedded in another embedded <laughs> domain-specific language, um, but it is just a function in the end of the day. Um, so there's various things you can do inside this little language um, to describe different kinds of rhythms. Uh, you can kind of speed up time for part of it. The more you add to it, the more, the faster it goes. And that's because the reference point is the metrical cycle and not the beat in general. Um, which is unusual compared to a lot of music software. That's because this is in this um, mini notation syntax for rhythms is um, inspired by Indian classical music, in, in particular, uh, polymetric syntax of another language called the Bol processor by Bernard Bell. Um, yeah. But yeah, so you can do things like polyrhythms. So that's like three steps against. So I think it repeats um, every, I can't work it out, I'm a bit too tired, sorry. <laughs> so eight, three, yeah, probably about 12, every 12 times or something. Um, so I don't really have time to explain all the syntax of this, but already just with this you can do lots of interesting rhythms. Um, so to answer your question about A in a pattern, so this would be uh, a pattern of strings, and sound is just turning it into a pattern of hashes, so key value pairs, uh, where sound is the pair, and um, uh, those uh, words which stand for sounds are the values. Um, so you can make patterns of lots of different aspects of sounds. So for example, I could 
make some distortion, maybe pitch up a bit. Um, or I could make that a pattern. So this hash symbol is combining two patterns of hashes into one. Um, and in this case, combining a continuous pattern with a discrete one. Uh, they've got to be discrete in the end, of course. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of these different effects, like adding reverb. Um, yeah, lots of fun. <laughs> so, what was I going to do? Oh, yes, yeah, so combining patterns. So, we've already seen how to just uh, combine two hashes, uh, patterns of hashes into one. Um, you can also do things like um, just add them together because patterns of numbers are uh, also numbers, so yeah, let's just start with It's a bit more relaxing than the previous rhythm um, So I can just add a number to that And I can pattern that as well Um, they don't have to have the same structure. So that's three things and four things, and it just adds them together. Um, so here, where there was that whole field, um, where events are being matched, the whole is becoming the kind of subset of both. Um, But I could also use a different um, operator to take the, the holes from the left. Um, in other words, take the structure from the left. And then you end up with a pattern with just four events. Um, or indeed from the right. Um, under the hood, this is all applicative um, so just like this but there's different applicative operators for the different ways of combining them this is something I'd like some advice on um, maybe not right now but um, if yeah if there's a nicer way of selecting which um, which kind of way of aligning patterns is being used. Um, I'll give a better example later. Um, so yeah, so the arithmetic operators are just like shorthands for applicative. That was nice. Um, so yeah. Uh, so you can also pattern parameters. So let's have a look at some other functions for manipulating patterns. Um, so, for example, fast, just to speed it up. Um, or slow it down. Um, but thanks to the power of monadic joins and binds and things, I can pattern that as well. Um, or make it go backwards. Um, and there, again, there's a lot of different ways of joining a pattern of patterns. Um, so, uh, for example, um, 
let me think. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the problem is that for a function, there's not an easy way of selecting which join you use. So that's another, that's the kind of main thing I'd like advice on. Um, so, but yeah, there's different ways of joining things. For example, um, Ply uses something called a squeeze join internally. So this will um, repeat each note twice or four times. Of course, that can be patterned as well. Um, but all that's doing internally is speeding up uh, each version of the pattern and then doing a squeeze join where the uh, um, events on the outer pattern uh, are the container for cycles within the inner pattern, that kind of thing. Um, maybe that's not describing it very well. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, I, I guess with patterns, there's so many different ways of combining patterns and that's the beauty of them. Um, and Timeful is, is kind of a playground for exploring them. Uh, so what else can we do? Yeah, so there's a whole combinator library of these different pattern transformations. Uh, so for example, you can just reverse, which would be the same as fast minus one. Um, you could do that, but only every third time. Uh, so that's like a higher order thingy. Um, or you could reverse it, but only in one speaker. Which all sounds good. I think that's my favorite um, Tidal function. Just makes everything sound better. Um, so, or you can uh, like, do jerks press to like shift things in time uh, and so on. Or let's take a simple um, yeah, I'll stick with mandolin sounds. They're quite relaxing for a Sunday afternoon. Um, so if I take that and just make a simple sequence, uh, not to seven. So that's just going up in notes, but I can make them go up according to a particular um, musical scale. Um, and then there's functions like iter which will skip, uh, in this case, a quarter of the cycle each repetition. Maybe with Jux it'll be a bit clearer if you can hear the original. Um, I think it uh, is really interesting because it's such a simple transformation. But to start with, it sounds randomized, and then after a while, you hear the pattern. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's one of my favorites as well. Um, Taper is a new one. So, this is inspired by uh, South Indian music, Carnatic music. Um, so, if we take eight steps of. Um, So that's just removing a step each time. Um, and then I can pattern that to make it go up again. So 
So I'll just do that to reset the clock. Um, so as I say, this is inspired by something called a yati in um, Carnatic music. Um, so I can use the same kind of syllables to try and join in with this algorithm. I'm going to give it a go, uh, see if I can do better than before. Um, so this has a different tala. It's uh, three claps, so clap, clap, wave, that's chord. You can join in if you want, um, but you have to clap every four steps. That's the tricky bit, while those steps are disappearing underneath you. Uh, so uh, I'll try it just by clapping, and then I'll try and join in with it. Yeah, very good, you're getting it. <laughs> so this, like 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, add up to 36, which is divisible by lots of numbers. It's great, including 12. So that's why when you do the tala, it lines up perfectly, which is what Carnatic music musicians love. Um, so let me try this. So ta di gi na tom 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 ta ka di na ta ki ta ta ka ta 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 ka ta ki ta ta ka di mi ta di gi na tom 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 ta. There you go. Managed it. Uh, I didn't quite get the tala right, though, but uh, I just get the syllables in the right place. Um, I think this is really interesting, actually, the idea of executing an algorithm yourself while your computer does the same. And I've kind of come to the position where I want to stop asking my computer to do any algorithm that I'm not prepared to do myself. Um, so... Um, got a bit more time. Uh, maybe it'd be nice to take a couple more questions, and then I'll do one final demo at the end um, to see you towards the barbecue. Well, um, sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, I thought you might ask that. No, that's actually implemented in JavaScript. Uh, I have made, I perform with one which is in Haskell called Feed Forward, but it's not working with the current version of Tidal, unfortunately. Um, and this is a brand new one by my friend Matthew. Uh, so what this offers, with, I mean, you can use any editor, like uh, Code or Emacs or Vim. Um, but what this gives you is the highlights, so you can see which events are producing the currently active events um, in the mini notations. That's why I'm using it, <laughs> even though it's not all Haskell. Um, sorry. What do the D1, D2, D3 mean? All right, so they're just different connections to the, um, to the synthesizer. Uh, they're actually stacked up into a single pattern in the end, um, but each one has a separate set of global effects. So that means you can put reverb on D2, but not have it on D3. Um, and it's just quite nice when you're spinning plates to have some one plate, plate spinning on D2 while you're working on D3 and sort of jump between these separate patterns. Um, so, yeah. Uh, could you say a few words about the, the highlighting? Because, you know, there's many, many layers of abstraction between, you know, the Haskell code you write and especially like a, a string literal and the, like where, you know, w w what is driving the sound that we are hearing. So, so could you explain a bit how that mapping is preserved and how you go back to highlighting? How the, so how, how it, the editor knows what's currently active. Um, yeah, so because the mini notation is passed in Parsec, that gives you the source code location within the string. But that doesn't help you with the source code location within the Haskell. Um, so there's a regular expression uh, that happens that wraps those mini notation strings 
in something that just tells the pattern what the offset of the mini notation is. Um, and then Tidor sends network messages to the editor to tell it when to highlight. If that makes sense. Um, it would be nice if it did something with um, uh, some AST thing to kind of uh, properly work, uh, do it in a nicer way than regular expressions. But, but yeah, that's how it kind of injects the information about where the pattern is into it, if that makes sense. Um, um, I know you said the longer the pattern is, the faster it goes, but is there a way to set a constant BPM? Yeah, yeah, so um, fast is relative to the cycle duration, but yeah, you can set the overall BPM. It's called cycles per second, though, so uh, you can just say make it 0 0.7 uh, if you get your indentation right. Um, uh, and of course, you can pattern that, so I could apply a sine wave to that. Um, and make some strange effects. Um, but that's actually global, that's EPS. That will affect other patterns running at the same time. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, you go there. Um, I, I see a lot of interesting syntax in your strings, and then around that, lots of very simple syntax for function composition application. Yeah. So I wonder, how, how much do you actually gain from having Haskell as the surface syntax, instead of just using your nice custom string efficient syntax for everything, and have to, a DSL, rather, a EDSL? Um, yeah, that would be interesting to kind of make it its own language, for sure. Um, it would be nice if the mini notation lived in the same world as the functions. Um, and I uh, can't remember his name at the moment. I can remember his Discord handle, <laughs> uh, polymorphic machine. Uh, Martin, someone. Yeah, he, he's kind of made a prototype of um, a fully passed um, uh, version of Tidal where it's, it is all in the same language. And I think ultimately that would be a nice way to go. Um, I suppose the problem is now there's this huge community of people used to this syntax who finally worked out what a dollar means and things like that. It's quite hard to move them onto a different syntax. But um, I should say I've also supported this to other languages uh, like JavaScript and Python. Um, so it, this kind of approach works in um, multi-paradigm languages as well. Um, but I'd say it could never be have been created in those languages, because I think it really needs those strict types and, and reasoning about types to really uh, come up with something like this. Um, so I'm still developing Tidal, even though there's these other versions of it. Um. Um, I saw both a speed combinator and a fast combinator, and right. I can't tell what's the difference. Yeah, so fast is changing the speed of the pattern, speed is changing the speed of playback, um, so if you have uh, something, um, that's better. <laughs> like this, it's, the speed is actually just a synthesizer control message to say, play it faster, and then it also goes up in pitch. Um, there is something that does both, so if I had um, a simple rhythm, um, I could use hurry, oops, my mouse pad's gone a bit high wire, to speed up both the pattern and the playback. Um, so yeah, it's a bit confusing. If I was going to remake Tidal, I'd try and make these different concepts clearer. But um, yeah. Yeah, that's just like applying hurry to successive quarters of the cycle. Um, make an interesting rhythm. Yes? I have another question. Um, so, 
for me, music is just a succession of, of notes and sounds, like there's no logic by and large to it. But um, if you have to program it, so have you ever tried to program a known piece? And then if you do, does it change your own understanding of a piece? Because you have to think about how the different parts interact. And have you ever done that? Have I? Like you... trying to replicate known music using this, and then has it changed how you think about it? Um, no, I haven't actually. <laughs> um, there are people who have made sort of cover versions in this, um, but I think this doesn't really afford transcription of existing music. I think Western music in general is about this kind of very linear idea of what music is, and this is much more about these cycles. Um, so I think it's a different kind of um, idea of what music is really. Um, uh, yeah, so when I look at these sort of cover versions, they all seem a bit awkward. Um, but I guess you can just use it like a sequencer. Uh, but yeah, um, I guess this is how I think about music. So <laughs> it's, yeah, I think we'd have to have a longer chat to get to the bottom of that question. I think it's an interesting one. I was wondering which of the sounds are sampled and which of the sounds are pro like properly synthesized. Like, like a FM oh, synthesizer or a subtractive yeah. synthesizer. Yeah, I forgot to mention no sounds are made by Tide or Tidal is just uh, patterning network messages in a protocol called Open Sound Control. Um, there's another system called Super Collider, which is another live coding environment for uh, digital signal processing and synthesis. Um, and that has um, a load of well, it's running something called SuperDirt in it that's made for Tidal, uh, and it's got both um, synthesizers and samples. Um, the thing about using samples is that you can cut them into tiny bits, and then that becomes its own kind of granular synthesis. So I don't see a huge difference between synthesized and sample-based triggering, except when I'm just triggering drum sounds like I'm doing here. Um, but actually, the super mandolin is uh, synthesis. Um, yeah. 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 So the question was, can you tweak the synthesizer parameters? And yes. So when you make a synthesizer in Super Collider, it automatically becomes available to Tidal, um, and you just have to define the function for sending that the name of that parameter, uh, and it just works. Um, yeah, are we doing time? OK, it's short time. <laughs> it's one or two more questions. Yeah, OK, and then I'll do a super short demo. Uh, so I'm curious about the uh, string language that you're using. Um, so I see that you have, like, scales Im embedded in it. I I'm curious, uh, to what extent do you have like more uh, complex mu music theory uh, concepts uh, embedded into this language? Because I guess music theory is very algebraic, so you can probably create some very interesting transformations. Yeah, so um, not too much, actually, um, because I'm not so interested in tonal music, I mainly am interested in rhythm. Um, people have contributed some kind of Western music theory ideas, particularly into the JavaScript version, actually. That's got sort of chord leading and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, you can um, add numbers together, um, but there's not a great deal of music theory embedded into it. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't do that apart from it's completely, there's no state um, really. So doing something like voice leading would be quite difficult, I suppose. Um, that's not completely true. You can make patterns of state transformations, but um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, not so much, but there is some. <laughs> um, so maybe, should we take one more question and then I'll do Yeah, let's do a final maybe. question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Super short demo. I don't know what I'm going to do. But. How easy is it to accidentally overload the system or get like in a state where it freezes or something? If you make a pattern that has too many beats per second or I don't know. How can you crash the system? Oh, crash the system. It's quite hard actually. Um, there's no built-in limits. 
Um, it's, it's surprisingly fast, like if I did 100 kick drums in half a cycle, it's, it's quite happy with that. And then it goes into the frequency domain, so you can sort of make little tunes. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'd rather really push it to its limits. Um, Super Collider is amazing, really uh, um, efficient. Right, I'm going to try and just make a really quick um, demo of. Um, oh, that's not right. Yeah. Something that I might do at an hour grave. Um, this isn't going to be completely improvised, but I'll start with a fairly randomly chosen sequence of drums. So offset by a quarter, I'll add seven to the samples. So now there's a different rhythm on top, offset by a quarter. work with longer samples, so if I just have a breakbeat um, looped over two cycles dropped into 16 bits. Tracks 
Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, move a bit away from the mic. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the talk. Uh, I hope many people are inspired to contribute to Steidl Cycles as well now. I'm sure he can use a lot of uh, technical contributions. Um, now, what's next? We have a quick announcement from Jane Street. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Richard Eisenberg, and... My name is Andre Mokhov. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, we're, we're both uh, from Jane Street, and we are very happy to have a, well, it says barbecue. Um, we're very happy to offer dinner to everybody. Um, <laughs> Uh, try to try to stay dry. Hopefully, I looked at the weather map. Maybe in an hour, it might dry out a little bit. Um, um, anyway, yeah. Uh, please enjoy. Yeah. And so, for the practical part of that, the food will be served uh, below here, so in the mensa, uh, so you can all go and uh, queue there uh, at your leisure, of course. Thank you.